Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Pitch Wars adult mentor video chat. I have a new background behind me, so that's cool. Um, so we have four mentors who are going to be joining us for the first hour, and then we will have three mentors replacing them for the second hour of the chat. If you want to ask questions, make sure you are asking those in the YouTube live chat. So if you're watching this on Twitter, you're going to want to make sure to click through into the um, the YouTube live page so that you can ask questions there. And our Twitter captain for today is Jessica Bayless. So she's going to be tweeting from the Pitch Wars account. She's going to be tweeting out some little tidbits. And if you ask a question on Twitter, she may be able to bring it over here if she has time. But that's not a guarantee. So make sure you um, click on through to YouTube live to ask your question. And wish lists are live. So our mentors can't answer questions about wish lists. However, what they can't do is they can't answer anything that is like a pre-query. So you can't like pitch your entire concept and be like, is this something you like? Um, that's not allowed in pitch wars in general and on this chat either. I think, oh, if you are just stumbling on this and you don't know what pitch wars is, make sure you go to pitchwars.org and you can find out all about pitch wars and also pit mod on that page. And if you missed the previous video chats and you want to go check those out, you can find all of them at the playlist that is available at bit.ly slash pitchwarslive. And this video chat is also going to be on that list. So you'll be able to find all of them in the same place once this is all over. Um, all right. I think we're ready to let the mentors introduce themselves. I am Sarah Nicholas. I am the managing director of Pitch Wars for 2019. I was a mentor mentor from 2012 to 2017 and I was a social media director last year and I am a young adult author I'm the author of keeping her secret among other things and so that's me and we will start with uh, Maxim hi everyone uh, my name is Maxim um, I was a pitch wars 2016 mentee and then I went off and wrote a different book and learned so much from Pitch Wars and was able to get an agent from that. And that book, which just came out this year, is called Kingdom of Exiles. Um, it is a fantasy romance novel, and that is my primary genre, though I read widely in all fantasy, and hence my wish list. Hi, everybody. I'm Gwen. I was also a 2016 Pitch Wars mentee with Maxim. And last year I worked on the Pitch Wars blog, this year I'm mentoring and I'm very glad to be here. Um, I write primarily contemporary romance, women's fiction, and I read everything and I'm looking forward to talking to you. Hi everyone, sorry I'm having some technical difficulties with my camera, but I'm definitely here. My name is Natalka Burian. I was an alternate in 2014, back when we had alternates in Pitch Wars, and I was a mentor in 2017. I'm um, the author of the YA novel, Welcome to the Slipstream, um, and also a cocktail cookbook called A Woman's Drink. Um, and my first adult novel uh, will be coming out with Park Row next September, um, and it's titled Among the Wild Young. I'm so excited to be here to talk about my wish list and chat with all these other mentors and answer whatever questions I can. Michael, you're muted. Michael, you're muted. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right, now you all can hear me. Okay, so I'm Michael Korst. I'm a first-time Pitch Wars mentor. I have written two books. So the first one is Rebuilt, which was a memoir of going deaf and getting a cochlear implant. That's actually my skull there on the cover. And then I wrote a second book uh, titled Worldwide Mind. And this was a popular science book. And I am now working on a novel. So I am deeply immersed in the craft of trying to learn how to write compelling characters and an interesting plot and so forth. So I'm looking forward to this first go round in Pitch Wars. All right. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We have some 
people watching. So we don't have any questions yet. So make sure you all ask questions, but don't worry. I have questions to start us off because we always kind of start a little slow. I did want to remind everyone that submissions open on September 25th. So you have about 10 days to get your submission ready. All right, so starting off with um, my question, and it is, what are your some of your tips for making uh, a query stand out in the slush? Anyone can jump in. <laughs> I, I can I jump in? I love query letters. It's like okay. my favorite. It's like my superpower. Um, I think the best thing that any hopeful can do. Um, whether approaching a mentor for pitch wars or an agent in the real world is to eliminate as many names. There's like as much bloating of details that you think are important and probably are important, but just in terms of gripping someone's attention, keep it clean, keep it clean and lean. Um, and also, um, yeah, just like when out, remove it. I think that's my big, that's my biggest advice with queries. Well, I'll jump in. I totally agree with Natalka. Is that how you pronounce it, N Natalka? That is. That's why I make sure I'm pronouncing your name right. So, yeah, no, that was perfect. Okay, good. Th good, thank you. So I totally agree with what Natalka said. Clean and lean is good. Trying to put in too much detail bogs the pitch down. I say this as someone who has pitched nonfiction many, many times. And I've learned not to try to cram the entire story into the pitch because then you just overwhelm the editor. And it's got to leap off the page. I mean, editors get so many pitches. Um, I was once in my agent's office and I saw the postman come in with a stack of, of manuscripts and pitches and queries like that, that high. It was huge. That was, that was the day's slush pile. So you really have to stand out. I also want to add, it's not just how good your pitch is. So you have to realize that the reader, the editor, or the agent has their own agenda. There are, there, there are things that they are looking for. So you could write the best pitch in the world and it's just not going to land with nine out of 10 of the people you send it for because it's not what they want. So you just have to remember you are not in complete control of the process. I have to totally echo what they both said. Um, you, you have to remember that even if your query is absolutely perfect, it just, you don't know what that agent editor already has or might already be working on. And as much as they love your concept, they might just have to pass on it because they have to respect that their, their existing client list. Um, and as far as Natalka said with terminology, especially as a fantasy writer, like it's really easy to come up with all of these terms that are super important to your story. And you think everyone's just going to understand them right away, but that's actually not true because you have what, 350 words for your query. And the last thing you want to do is confuse everyone. But just like one other tip, I would say really focus on your stakes. Um, that's what really gets agent editor attention is like, oh my gosh, what is going to happen to this character if X, Y, and Z do or don't happen? And how does that drastically affect the plot or and or their character's life, basically. And I wanted to add, you don't want to have too many story details, but you don't want to be vague. I, what I see a lot in queries is somebody saying, they have to save the world or there will be trouble, things like that. So what you have to do is remember that your query is a sales tool and you're trying to hook an audience. So the most Thing that the best thing you can do for yourself is to punch it up and use active language in it and make sure that the goal, the motivation, and the conflict are clear and don't give away the ending. Leave it on a hook. I want to add just one more thing. I think that doing a little homework on the person you're pitching helps. I don't know for a fact that editors like it when you show you've done some homework on their list, but it seems to me that it can't hurt to say, I'm pitching you because I see your list includes titles like X, Y, and Z. And that will tell the reader that you are not just randomly sending 20 people the exact same pitch and hoping something sticks. That was great. I, uh, sh very short, shameless plug. I have a video coming out on Monday on all my query tips. So, um, all right. So Joanna asks, if I have a new adult novel that I want help turning into an adult novel, should I mention that in my query? And this is specifically for pitch wars, not, not necessarily for agents, right? So.
Anybody deal with new adult? I mean, I'm, I'm accepting. Oh, go ahead, Natalka. No, no, no. Go, go for it. Go ahead. As I say, I'm accepting new adult, but I do have the caveat that I will likely ask you to age up. So I don't know if it's necessary to state that in the query um, for pitch wars, right? Like if you're querying an agent, as Sarah said, I wouldn't put that in your details. But for, for pitch wars, like I, I, I guess I don't need to know that. I will just read the submission and determine like, hey, like maybe this voice is a little young and we need to age it up. Or that's a discussion that you have like later down the line. No, totally. And I think it's it's helpful to be forthcoming at this stage, obviously not when you're when you're approaching a, an agent um, or an editor. But I think at this stage, it's, it's good to be forthcoming with your mentor from the beginning and say, look, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm not willing to do just to manage those expectations going in. And also, you can look at wish lists. I know mine says that I will likely ask ask you if you're submitting new adult to consider aging it up to adult. So if that's something that you're willing to do, that's great. And if not, then I'm not the right mentor. Great. Okay. I feel like most of the mentors who are accepting new adult are looking to age it up or down depending on their category. Mary asks, I've read in some craft books that your prologue should never be after when your story starts such as prologue, then chapter one, four days later. Several, no, some craft books, so more than one craft book she's read this in. Um, so I feel like that's a start to the answer, right? Anybody have any thoughts? I'll, I'm not a I'll jump in on that if I can. I'm really suspicious of these kind of broad rules, okay? There's a classic novel by Isaac Asimov titled The Gods Themselves that starts with chapter four, okay? And it works beautifully. I think you have to write the story the way the story itself needs to be told. You know, I heard another rule lately that you're never supposed to start a novel with your character waking up, okay? I'm sure there's some brilliant classic out there that does exactly that. So I personally pay no attention to, to, to broad rules like that. Yeah, I think it can be dangerous to limit yourself by these like, you know, craft book rule, these like lists of rules. When you're drafting, it's good to experiment and let yourself go where you ever you need to go. And um, I think that's true. I mean, I think, what is it that Kafka, the metamorphosis starts with, I, I woke up, you know, as a bug. So you never know what, you know, when it's going to serve you, when it's not going to serve you. That's what editing is for. So I think when you're drafting and at this stage, um, people shouldn't be too committed to, you know, breaking the rule, breaking the rules or not breaking the rules. In general, I'm not a huge prologue writer. So I think you just kind of have to ask yourself, what's the point of the prologue? And is it really adding to the progression of your plot? And, you know, if it's needed, that's totally fine. But you see a lot of agents and editors and people out there who are like, who just are adamantly against prologues. And I'm, again, that's another broad rule. So don't follow it if it doesn't work for your story, but just really think about what that prologue is adding. And if it's taking away from that immediate impact that you could get by chapter one, something of that sort, then I would reevaluate sort of your stance on whether or not it needs to be used. And I would also say that if your prologue is largely backstory, there are probably better ways to include that information than all at once at the beginning. So part of what we would do as mentors would be to help you figure out where to place that information so that it's not a giant info dump up front. Not that you can't do that. I mean, James Joyce did it beautifully, but um, there are probably other ways to do that. So consider whether or not the information in your prologue is something that you need to have all at once at the beginning. That's my best advice. I'll also add, and I think y'all um, kind of hinted at it is the reason that you see this advice is so much is that so many people do prologues poorly especially this type of prolo prologue where you're you know starting in the future usually dumb because the writer can't figure out how to make the first chapter interesting um and so if if that's the case then you definitely need to take a hard look at why you have this pro prologue and if it's actually needed and i think that's why so many people are against it because i know um when reading slush i never once saw a prologue that I thought was necessary. Um, and I read Slash for two and a half years. So 
Um, Baptiste asks, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received when it comes to writing or publishing? I'll take that on. <laughs> the best advice that I've ever received is don't stop. Um, publishing is a long game. And if you're looking for immediate gratification, you're likely going to be upset by that. So keep going. Yeah, I definitely echo what Gwen said. For me, it's that and then um, just sort of embracing your own journey because there is no one direct path to publication. And if you're sitting there constantly comparing yourself to other people's journeys and how they got to their book published or their movie deal or whatever that next step is, you'll you'll never be in that place where you can really just enjoy what you've created. I would say the best piece of advice that I've gotten is is to write every day or as much as possible. So my personal goal every day is to write a thousand words a day. And I'm well aware that a lot of the thousand words may be unusable. But most of my writing is rewriting rather than writing. So even writing a crappy thousand words gives me something to work with when I come back the next day. So a lot of it's just that ability to crank out text. There's some German word, which means something like um, butt glue, okay, where you are able to glue your butt to the chair and just stay there until you finish when you need to finish. So I have written many, 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 many words that have never ended up in the final draft. And that's just how you get it done. Um, I would, these are all amazing pieces of also add one of the most valuable things anyone ever told me was don't take all of the feedback you get. Um, really sit with all the feedback you hear um, and then take what resonates with you only. Um, and to be sure that goes. Did we lose Sarah? <laughs> I think we lost Sarah. Oh no! Uh, well, we can just keep going till she yeah. gets back. <laughs> so we can, I don't know how to display the comments on the screen, but I, I mean, I can see them, so we can just move on to the next one. Yeah, we'll yeah, just read it out loud. Okay, Perfect. so um, we have from Dawn. How much emphasis is placed on a potential mentee's past publications, or does it matter? Oh, I don't think it matters. Yeah, I don't. Mm -mm. Nope. Not for me. I mean, like, uh, we might ask, some mentors might ask, like, what your querying has looked like, if this is a, a submission that's already been out there, and just for our knowledge. But that doesn't necessarily, like, get you one foot in the door or, like, out out the door. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, I think I think is great, but at the end of the day, it's a script you're submitting right now. That's yep. what I'm interested in. Yep. Okay. Uh, next question from Columba. In terms, and I apologize if I pronounce any of these names wrong. <laughs> in terms of comps, can you mention three, say two novels and a movie, or would that be too many? I think three is good. Yeah. I think the, the important thing to remember about comps is just not to um, overreach with them and make sure that they actually kind of fit with your, your plot and your storyline or your, your characters. Um, one of the things that I've seen done really well when you mention comps is it's not just like, a meets B. It's the character development of A meets the plot progression of B so that they really, that when people read it, they really understand that you're taking the time to say, okay, so my book shares similarities in this way, if that makes sense. But I, I don't think there's like a hard and fast rule for how many numbers. I mean, I guess I wouldn't say five because that would just be a lot. All right. Um, sorry, my internet went out for a couple of minutes, so I don't, I don't know what I missed. <laughs> okay, and Nicole, Natalka cut out, but she is yeah, back now. So. I'm back. Okay, cool. So are we ready for the next question? Yeah, so Sarah, we just kept reading through the comments. So we just okay. talked about 
um, Columba's question about terms of comp. So if anyone else wants to weigh in on that before we move on. Okay. I think I think as many, I mean, I'm more, especially at this stage, again, working with a mentor, we would help you clarify what you what you're trying to say with those comps but i think for me i love i think it's cool to know what you're what you are um playing with and what you think is um what ballpark you think your book is in and whether those are movies shows books i for me it's just helpful to know where you think this is going i think it's great as many as you can for me and i would just say that comps are great i don't I don't need to see them in a query letter, but if you have them, that's fantastic. I would caution against using too many that are too diverse because you would probably confuse the reader if you said, I've got a piece of this and a piece of that and a piece of that and a piece of that. And then I would wonder how focused your story is gonna be. So use them carefully. Um, but if you find great ones, they tell a lot in a little bit of time, a little bit of space. So they're good to have. All right. Um, did you answer the question from Don about the potential mentees past publications? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> okay, so Don has another question. For query letters, I read that they should not be personalized to mentors. Is that correct? And the answer is yes. Do not personalize the uh, queries that you write to mentors. That is actually in the submission FAQ. So it is a official printed rule. So we don't have to discuss that. <laughs> I've seen mixed feedback in the mentor workshop blogs. I'm putting the title word count and genre at the front of the queries or at the end. Is there a preferred format for pitch wars? This is another one I feel like we can mention real quick. Um, it honestly doesn't matter. Some people have slight preferences one way or the other, but it is not a deal breaker in any way, shape or form, right? Anything else? Okay. You know, I think Stacey Hurst's question is very interesting. Can we discuss that one? Um, we're going in the order. So um, yeah, we'll we'll get to it further down. Yeah, um, so we're going to in order the questions that were asked. Um, I have a question about timing. Is there a benefit to submitting as soon as the window opens or will all submissions during the period be considered? All submissions will be considered. A lot of mentors don't even look until the submissions have all come through. Don't worry about timing at all. The only thing you want to worry about in timing is if you're trying to submit in those last two hours and there is a um, like a technical glitch or whatever, then <laughs> we, may, we may not be able to help you if you don't have any time plan there. Can you all still hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, are any of you accepting women's fiction? I am. Okay. I so am we have, too. A question, we have a question about word count in women's fiction. Um, and I've said this before, but we do ask that you not ask questions that are basically just asking the mentors to tell you that your high word count is okay. But um, we can talk about kind of in more uh, general details, word counts and how that affects your decision. Um, I will say that it's a really good idea to know what the industry standards are in terms of word count. And during pitch wars, one of the things that I experienced as a mentee was bringing my man <clears throat> excuse me, bringing my manuscript up to word count. I was a little low. So there's lots of room in pitch wars to either add or subtract to get to that sweet spot so that you'll be ready for the agent showcase. So at the beginning, I wouldn't worry so much about word count unless you're way out of range, but you have to be willing to either add or subtract as necessary, any genre. Totally agree. Absolutely. Okay, so I don't know what's going on with the internet right now, but y'all can still hear me? Then that's fine, and we'll figure out the rest later. Shoshana asks, uh, on queries, any advice on how to pitch ensemble cast manuscripts? Um, so no single protagonist whose gender you can focus on, but they don't want to be too general without character specifics. Are we thinking like Six of Crows where every chapter has like its own, its own protagonist? 
Sure. But, sure. I, I, I mean, like, I'm not sure how, how Leia put her query letter together. I mean, I, I would love to be on first name basis with her. <laughs> but um, I think there's still an underlying like plot line that is the emphasis of that story, um, even with an ensemble cast that you kind of just have to hone in on and maybe pick the most important points that will progress and catch the attention of agent editor in this case mentor um like for me like uh, i write dual pov so it's not quite ensemble but like i when i orchestrate my my query letter one paragraph is about one um, mc and the second one is about the other mc but it's still very much about the total plot and um i think you just have to kind of pick and choose and Again, if you're unsure about this with an ensemble cast, this is something that mentors can help with when we actually see the query letter and how it's put together. Totally. I would also focus on characteristics. What kind of a group is this? Like, what's the dynamic? I think you can write a really, tell a really compelling story in just a couple of sentences if you can capture those specifics um, well and clearly. All right, Kelly is watching us with her mom. <laughs> so she wanted to say hi. Um, her mom came over and she's like, we're watching this. <laughs> okay, Baptiste asked, would you consider a non-native English speaking mentee? Asking for a friend who is also French. What a coincidence. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, that's, yeah. yes. Of course. I mean, Joseph Conrad, you know, his native language was Polish, but he wrote in English. So it all depends on how good your English is. For sure. Absolutely. All right. We are in agreement. Is there a limit to how many submissions each mentor can receive? Like Rev Pitt? No, there is not. Unfortunate for some mentors. <laughs> um, Columba asks, when is it okay to mention backstory in chapter one, or is that a no-no? I'll tackle that because I'm really struggling with that in my own work. So I'm writing this very ambitious science fiction novel in which there's a great deal of information that the reader has to know. So I'm really struggling with how much of that backstory do I slip into that first chapter without bogging it down. It helps a bit that in science fiction, there are certain conventions that the, that the experienced science fiction readers know that a good writer will give you enough of the backstory as the novel goes. So you know you don't have to put a ton of the backstory in in chapter one. So I think that's a good general rule right there. But that's always just complicated for me. You know, I try to sort of slip in a few short paragraphs to hint at this, hint at that, and then pick up on things that will be explained in more detail later. Yeah, I think this is another hard and fast rule kind of thing that you have to just be careful about. Um, you can have some backstory in, in chapter one, but I, I I wouldn't put in a ton personally because chapter one is all about like hooking hooking your readers and getting them to keep moving forward. And, and backstory is necessary, especially when you get into these genres like sci-fi and um, for me, fantasy, you always have that line of how much is too much and when do I introduce it? Um, but I think the, a really important thing you can do is to just think about your character. And in that moment, would your character, if something is happening, really be thinking about their backstory? Or is it something that as the novel progresses, if it triggers them, then they might think about it. And that's when the reader needs to know about it, not up front with all this information that they could forget as the story progresses. And then you're in chapter 10 and your character does something and no one like might not understand why because you introduced it in chapter one and th there's so much that happened between one and 10 that they might not remember. And like Michael said, a lot of the way that backstory is introduced is genre specific. So if you're not writing science fiction, which does require some world building and setup up front, same thing with fantasy. If you're writing something like, you know, a contemporary romance or women's fiction, any of those kind of things, there are ways of getting in the information that you need and that is giving people backstory, but it doesn't seem like you're getting a whole bunch of backstory all at once. So if you can slip in bits of information as they're appropriate, then you've created 
a feeling of backstory without giving a whole bunch of um, info dumping in your first chapter, which is something that you don't want to do really do in any genre. You want to keep the flow going. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm 100 percent on that. It's all about, especially in the first in the first couple chapters, I would I would say sustain that momentum and not get bogged down and like, oh no, the, you know, our read my of this or this or this. Just you want to keep them reading so that that can be revealed in a more organic way as they come. Okay, I Michael has to leave a little bit earlier and early, and he did want to address this question. So we're going to skip ahead, and then we'll come back to the other questions. And that's the question from Stacy: um, Do quiet, more literary books have a more difficult chance of getting noticed in the slush pile? I think that's a really interesting question because I wondered that myself. So you think, for example, how would Charles Dickens fare in today's world? His novels are a very slow build. How would Henry James fare? And I think we live today in a world where there's so many attentional demands on readers that the very device on which you're reading is itself can itself be a distraction to your reading process. So I think there is this tremendous pressure to start novels off with a huge bang, you know, you know, bam, the narrator's dog dies in the first two pages and the evil ogres are about to attack by page three, you know, to really get that quick, that quick grab. Um, and I wonder if that is, if that disadvantages books that are deliberately a slow burn. And I don't know the answer to that, to that myself in today's market. So I just think it's a great question. Um, I can say that for me, in terms of well, I know um, the answer for myself. That is Natalka, go ahead, and we'll have one. No, 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 please go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say that I, I definitely am o very open to quiet, more literary. A writer. For me, it's all about the writing itself. I mean, no matter what, at the end of the day, you're choir litter, all but for me, when I'm going through my slush pile, I'm going to look for writing and it doesn't matter the volume. I'm excited to discover beautiful work. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's all about the writing and the rest of it is gravy. <laughs> so, um, we have this discussion a lot when Pit Mad comes around, and literary novels are definitely disadvantaged in Pit Mad, and it's just it's just not the right format for pitching, you know, that kind of book. Um, and and also, it depends on who's looking too. So, if people who are interested in literary fiction are looking, then they're going to be they're going to find those, and they're going to be interested in those. Whereas if you're talking about someone who's specifically looking for commercial fiction, then they're not going to notice those as well. So it also depends on whose eyes are on it. Okay. Um, do any of y'all have hard limits for word count, especially for fantasy? So Maxim, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I actually think I have this caveat in my in my wish list, uh, but it's it's very like. It might be a bad idea if, because I, I don't want to say, again, like if you have these hard and fast rules, like you could, you don't want to limit yourself. But just given the scope of pitch wars and how much time we have, I would say like if you're over 130,000, it just might be really difficult for us to get into the nitty gritty of your work in the amount of time that we have. Um, and that's not to say that that isn't potentially appropriate for a fantasy novel. Um, I mean, like, some of J.K. Rowling's books are way more than that, right? And uh, I will note that, and this is this is not an across the board thing for publishing, but just my own experience with my publisher and editor that they liked that I came in a little bit on the lighter side, like the 87 to 95 range, because then we had a lot of room to build. And so like my final book was more close, close closer to 110. And that's just really to give you that, that space to develop the areas that your editor thinks need to be developed and help with the, the plot progression and your character development, which is which are all things that your mentors will help you with in Pitch Wars as well. 
but I would say that there's not a hard and fast rule, but like uh, if you're submitting 130, 150 K that it just might not be enough time really. Well, I think a lot obviously depends on the quality of the writing. So a really well-written novel will be much, much more fun to read. And so the word limit would matter much less to me. I'm aware that there are definitely word count limits in various genres. And I'm struggling with that myself. So my manuscript, my manuscript is 110,000 words long. And I just feel like I've begun to scratch the surface of the story. So just like this could easily be half a million words in order to inhabit this world. So I'm really trying to figure this out myself. So I don't have any easy answer to that, but I will say that a well-written piece that is longer than average would be preferable to me than a clumsily written piece that is much shorter. In the end, it's about the quality of the words, not so much the number of the words. And I say this as a writer, I'm not saying this as an editor who has to think about the marketplace and the sizes of books and so forth. Anyone else? All right, Hugh asks, how do you approach editing, especially big picture edits? It's a very open-ended question. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I, I would um, approach, I mean, obviously it's gonna be on a case by case basis, depending on what the book needs. But the process for me is always going to be to read the entire thing, to think about the right beginning for it and to see if all the pieces fall in order or if they need to be rearranged. Um, so we would do the developmental pieces first, then go through afterwards and make sure that the line edits were done. And of course the developmental work includes characterization, plot, all of those good things, putting those all together. But on a really meta level without seeing a manuscript in front of me, it's hard to say how I would approach editing that particular book. But in general, that would be my process. Well, I would say having read many, many manuscripts that I make almost no marginal notations when, when I read I really think about the big picture. What I generally do is I write a response that might be four or five single space pages long, where I'm really trying to give the writer a fresh perspective on their work, which I think is the most valuable thing that a reader can do to allow a writer to see their work through fresh eyes, rather than getting bogged down into this paragraph didn't work and that character needs to be a little bit more this or that. I, I, I try to to, to do it from the biggest perspective possible, because I personally think that that is the most helpful to, to writers. I totally the place to begin is always the macro. You're always going to go through it all and sort of see what's working, see what's not working. But I would also extend um, in that collaborative and dynamic, you know, it should be a conversation. Um, and certain, you know, you might have, the writer might have some some information that I don't have when I'm reading, and I'm kind of always my edit letter will have questions too. It's important to sort of like go through that first that first macro round, ask those questions, have all those questions, and then go back in and dive even deeper. Um, and I will say, I know I missed the word count, um, I missed the vote on the word count answer, but this sort of factors into that as well. If if someone came to you with a really ginormous manuscript, I would say cast up into more than one book, or, you know, there are lots of solutions. I think there's a time in the, in the editing process that's very solution oriented. And I think that's exactly this first macro um, structural path. Yeah, I don't really have a ton more to add because I feel like uh, all of my mentors hit on, co-mentors hit on it very, very well. I think it's reading the whole book, just thinking about how your story is progressing and then open dialogue because it's your story at the end of the day. And I might have these ideas, but if it doesn't work with you, then we need to, to figure out something that is going to work for your story and the way it progresses. And honestly, communication is key. All 
All right, so we got a question about prologues and we did discuss prologues um, pretty extensively at the beginning. So I'm gonna just say to make sure you rewind and watch that whenever this chat is over. Um, and we have another question about word count. Uh, we always get a lot of questions about word count. Um, my novel is slightly short, still within accepted bounds, but almost definitely needs more. I'm trying to expand before submission while still polishing it. Will it be a red flag to mentors? I would say not. Um, you know, what matters really is the quality. In a sense, words are cheap. I've probably thrown out three quarters of all the words I've written. So what matters is the quality of what's there. If it's good, it can always be expanded. So I'm saying absolutely not. <laughs> I like how we unmute at the same time and then kind of like pause and look at each other like who's going to talk first. Um, I was just going to uh, agree with Michael. Yeah, it's not not an issue for me if it's on the lighter side because I think there's always room for expansion. And I was going to say, I would rather have it come in on the lighter side and have room to explore with a mentee exactly where they want to go than to just have to spend the whole time cutting words out of a manuscript. It's so much harder to make someone else kill those darlings um, instead of exploring territory together. It's a very different tone to the whole to the whole process. I am an underwriter, so I tend to write my first draft short. Um, but I did want to say caveat that if we're talking about like half of the length of what it should be, then that might be a red flag because I have got in young adult submissions that were not in verse that were like 25,000 words. And that's just, that's um, not, it's not a novel yet. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, uh, Michael has to leave early. So if, if you need to duck out, Michael, just go ahead and do that. And, um, we'll, we'll see you later. Um, so Columba asks in the submission form, does it make any difference what order you list your four mentor choices in, or will it be, or will all four be considered equally? It does not matter. And in fact, most of them are in alphabetical order because the list is in alphabetical order. So people just choose them like that, but the mentors do not pay attention to that. They don't care. I don't know how many times I can say this. I actually answered this question like 300 times last year. So I just wanna make it very clear that this does not matter. <laughs> um, okay, is the POV and tense effect, does POV and tense affect reading preferences? I've scared some wish lists and it's not clear. I feel like young adult mentors have really strong feelings about POV and tense, but I don't know how y'all feel. <laughs> So this is something I didn't put in my wish list, but maybe I, I should have. I, it's uh, I don't even know how to answer this question because I have read um, various tenses and POVs and been totally fine with it. But I would say my preference is past past tense. Uh, present tense is a little hard for me, but if it's really well done, like. Fine. And honestly, present tense is really common in romance and I am accepting romance. So that's fine. I think it's present tense fantasy that I have a little bit of an issue with sometimes, but that's just a weird reader distinction for me that will not discredit you. If you write present tense fantasy and submit to me and it's beautiful, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for it. Like I'm going to grabby hands it. Like it doesn't matter so much to me. So I don't know if that really answers your question. <laughs> Yes, I'm open to all tenses. Just putting that out there. I'm also open to all tenses, but I would beg you to be consistent with them. Um, don't go back and forth between present, past, first, and third within the same character. That's a kind of a no thing for me. I would say, again, it's a matter of quality. I mean, you think Catch from the Rye, right? That's a first-person novel. But the voice is so compelling that it just sweeps you right along. Same for Great Gatsby also, for example. I am a little wary when I see present tense at the beginning because I think that a lot of beginning writers think that think that the first person, sorry, I mean first person, think that first person is somehow easier, that it's then it's less demanding, so you can write a good novel more easily in the first person. 
And I think that can be a very misleading, um, misleading assumption. So first person can be done brilliantly, but it has to be done brilliantly in order for it to really work. Anybody else? I think everyone got a chance to answer that question, right? I um I have a friend who read my first book, and I you know told me how much she loved it. And well, she was like an acquaintance at the time. She's a friend now, and she was just telling me how much she loved it, and she thought it was so fun and all this, and um just like really genuine. You know, sometimes people are like, oh yeah, I liked your book, and <laughs> but she was like really genuine about it. And then more recently, she said that she hated first person present tense, and I was like, well, dragons was in first person present, and she's like was it? She didn't even notice. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, you, uh, you may have a preference one way or the other, but you may not notice if it is, well, hopefully my book is well done. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but <laughs> all right. So Elizabeth asks on romance, how do mentors feel about love triangles? So if mm -hmm. an external force was putting, bye Michael. <laughs> Say if an external force was putting the heroine with one person, but she likes someone else, and everyone is mature about it ultimately. I can answer this really quickly because love triangles are a no for me. Uh, that's just one of those things that's really hard for me to get around. But the other romance mentors might feel differently. Also, I, I'm really curious to what your definition of like, uh, I guess, what do you mean by ultimately mature? I know you can't really answer, but like, that's that's an interesting side note that I just want to know about. Anybody? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with love triangles. I think it's okay as long as you write them well. It's, it all comes back down to the writing eventually. Yeah, same. I'm, I'm with Gwen here. I'm, I'm okay with them. Also, I, I don't really understand the parameters the question is asking about. But um, again, like I'm always, it's always case by case for me. And I think Sorry, um, I was trying to read through the questions for the next one. So Laurel, she had said that we covered her word count question, um, but should they mention in the query that we know it likely needs to be expanded on or is that assumed? I don't think it needs to be mentioned. I think you just, it's something that you can discuss with your mentor in, I don't like uh, in, in past, and I don't know if this is the case, but as a mentee, when mentors requested from me, they would ask in an email, like, how do you feel about X, Y, and Z? And um, that's usually where they, I would get the question, like, how do you feel about expanding? Or how do you feel about cutting? Or how do you feel about this and this? And that is, I think, where you might get that word count discussion. Anybody else? OK. Kaylee asks, for romance submissions, is it important to meet both main characters in the first chapter? Or would you take on a submission where they are introduced in separate chapters. Generally, the industry standard is to have them meet in the first chapter. But for me personally, if I liked the first chapter enough and wanted to read on to see what was happening, I would be happy to have them introduced in separate chapters. But in that situation for a Pitch Wars submission, I would need to be clear from your synopsis or your query that there, you know, when in a, when in the story that was going to happen, so that I wasn't going through like five chapters waiting for the next character to arrive. I agree with. Yeah, I think uh, that's great. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's all I was going to say. Is <laughs> no, me too. I totally agree. Also. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you're given like one scene each before they can meet, and that's really kind of the maximum in romance. <clears throat> um, Don asks, would you say a slow burn novel is always turned literary? I would just say no, but. <laughs> yeah, no. I think slow burn is just a, a way that you could potentially write. Like I would argue that some 
fantasy could even or sci-fi or anything could be slow burn. It just depends on what you're doing. Sarah Rose Mayer asks for romance submissions. How important is the main character having sex in the main characters? Sorry, having sex in the first book. I, I mean, uh, there, there's different types of romance subgenres. So if you're writing a sweet romance or an inspirational romance, um, it's possible that it just might not happen. I think you just have to think about your genre and what your readers expect. Like if you're writing an erotic romance, I would highly say, yes, there needs to be sex in book one. Um, but other than that, I think it just depends on, on your subgenre. I mean, personally, I want to see it, but like, <laughs> that, there's a, that's not like a, a parameter for all romance novels. No, totally. And I think it's not so much the sex itself, so often sex is just like progress, you know, it's like that's the plot moving forward. So if you show me the plot moving forward, it doesn't have to be like intercourse, you know, like you could literally, there's so many ways to do it. Um, that being said, yes, like it's a romance novel. There's probably, you're going to have to probably have some sex in there at some point. Um, but, but no, it's not a hard and fast rule for me. And I would also add that as long as the, um, your intimate scenes, your sex scenes move your plot forward, it's great to have them. If they don't move the plot forward and it's just there because somebody thought there needed to be more sex, then I would caution against doing it that way. Yes, Gwen, that's such good advice. All right, um, we have a procedural question that I will answer it while we're in the middle of switching writers over. And we'll try to get one or two more questions with this set of mentors. Maxwell asks, will you be reading submissions in the order you receive them or all the query letters and start with your favorites? Maybe just in a more general sense, talk about um, how you read through. I think everyone, has everyone been a mentor before? No? Yes. Okay. Um, some people have. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So just kind of talk about your overall like reading plan and process, maybe. Um, I usually go in order. I mean, that's usually my thing. I, I think it keeps more organized. Um, I will take a deeper dive if something's really if something's really interesting to me. But usually, I will go in order just to make sure I hit everything um, that I need to. I imagine that I will be doing the same. I do have a slush reader, so that could potentially alter the way that I read the submissions, but they will all be reviewed in some order. <laughs> and I was a slush reader last year. It was great. It was a lot of fun. And I read in order um, for about the first two thirds, and then I started skipping around, but I did read all of them. So I imagine I will be doing it the same way this year. And I do have somebody that's gonna help me read but I'll ask her to read in order to. I feel like every year I would be like, I'm gonna read in order. I'm not gonna request until I've read all the queries. And then there'd always be like one or two manuscripts. And I'm like, I have to request it right now. So <laughs> whatever your plan is, sometimes it goes out the window depending on what you've read. Um, all right. Mm, one last question for this group of mentors. Um, and it's a good question. Sarah Rosemayer again asks, I don't know if this has already been asked, but out of all the many submissions, how do you make the final pick? <laughs> oh man, this is really a tough, a tough one. I think for me, last, last, the last time I mentored, I, or Mentor over a manuscript, um, but ultimately, like worked it out, and like I, I didn't, I didn't sort of like I had to renew. Once I was like let that go, I sort of had to re, like re effort and look at my journey a different way, I guess. So I, it, it like, it, and it was the book I was on different than the book that, I, um, but both. I mean, I was equally excited about. You could pick like. 10 is a good answer, but it's, it's you're going to bring if you're be excited about about many many stories and um sometimes it's just about food where you are as a reader and a writer and like 
learn or what can you offer? Um, I say there was no, I was spoiled in my experience. Wonderful options, and it really just came down to who did I think I could the most. I think, I mean, this is my first time being a mentor, so this will be a fun experience for me. But I, I have to agree with Natalka that, like, I've even seen some, like, the concepts and in, in the forums and what y'all have been talking about, and you're all are so talented. So it's going to be very difficult to make that final pick. But it, it genuinely, for me, will come down to, you know, does it meet the stuff on my wish list? Is it voicey? Does it capture my attention? Can I help you is the biggest one, right? If you're already perfect, like, go query. Like, I'll, I'll tell you, go query. Like, maybe, like, it's it really does come down to what can I offer you as a mentor to help you get where you need to be? Yep, exactly what both um, Natalka and Maxim have said. It's for me. It's going to be a question. It may not the the book that I pick may not be my favorite out of everything, but it will be the one that I know that I can help make a difference with. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. I was notorious for like always being the last one to submit my pick and I would always because I would be like narrowed down to like two or three and just not be able to make the decision <laughs> until I was forced to. All right, so um, we are out of time for the first hour. So I'm going to ask each of these mentors to let us know where we can find you online. And if you have anything coming up that you want to let people know about, like a book coming out or a giveaway or, you know, anything like that. Uh, we'll start with Maxim. Yeah, um, so you can follow me online on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, at Maxim McKay, M-C-K-A-Y. Um, happy to answer any other questions about my wish list or pictures in general or publishing. Um, if you just want to shoot me a message um, on Twitter, I will get to it throughout the day. Um, my book, as I mentioned earlier, is Kingdom of Exiles. It is out right now. It is a fantasy romance book. Um, we have some exciting news potentially to announce here in the next couple of weeks, but I can't say anything yet. And the second book comes out next year. So um, it's one of six. So just be ready for a long ride. <laughs> Natalka? Yeah, um, you guys can find me at Natalka Burian on Twitter. I'm available there to answer any questions about wish list stuff. To to get into that discussion. Um, again, I'm also happy to talk about publishing and writing and like that. I'm on Instagram at ndbur. Um, my website's natalkaburian.com. And I have um, two books out. Again, A Woman's Drink from Chronicle, which is a cocktail cookbook. And um, Welcome to the Slipstream, a YA novel. And my next is not yet available for pre-order. Um, but when it is, I'll let everybody know. I had a great time talking to all of you. Gwen? Yep, you can find me on Twitter at Gwen Jackson, and I'm on Instagram at gj.writes, and I've got books on submissions, so I've got nothing in terms of that with news to tell you, but it's been great talking to you, and thank you for stopping by. All right, I just wanna thank our mentors for stopping by and answering questions. I am gonna put the upcoming um, video and Twitter chat schedule on the screen while we get everyone removed. So um, thank you all for coming out and uh, see you later. Um, and so if everyone watching, just give us one second while we switch over the mentors to the second shift, as you will. All right. Um, and just a heads up to our mentors waiting in the wing, you are going to appear on camera in about one second. So. <laughs> All right. Hello. How are y'all doing? Okay, so I'm going to have this round of mentors introduce themselves. So just like your name, what you write, um, if you have any books published, what your history with Pitch Wars is, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, let's start with Kate. Hi, um, Kate Lansing. I write cozy mysteries and I'm looking for mysteries. My first book is going to come out June 2020 with Berkeley next year. It's the first of uh, three books that I have under contract with them. Did I forget to say anything else, Sarah? 
Um, I think you're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Susan? Hey, everybody. I'm Susan Bishop Perspell. Uh, I write magical women's fiction, and also I've been working on some magical YA that is out on submission right now. Uh, my two books that are out with St. Martin's Press are The Secret Ingredient of Wishes and Dreaming in Chocolate. And I don't have copies to show you because I am moving to Scotland tomorrow, and which is why I'm currently sitting on the floor in my empty house because I have no furniture left. <laughs> but you can go find my books. There's one of them has pie on the cover and one has a hot chocolate mug on the cover. Hi everybody, my name's Hallie Sutton. I'm a feminist um, crime thriller writer and my debut novel, The Lady Upstairs, will be coming out from Putnam next summer. Um, I was a 2018 Pitch Wars mentee and I will be co-mentoring this year with Lane Fargo, who was my mentor last year. So very excited to be here. All right, so we're just gonna dive into the questions that we have waiting in the wings. Um, let's see, yeah, we do have a couple of questions waiting, so. Uh, since, okay, Jennifer asked, since a lot of us are new at writing query letters, how much weight does a letter carry when picking a mentee? Um, I can start, this is my first year doing Pitch Wars as a mentor, so I'll be kind of learning as I go, I think, but, for me going into it, I don't expect the query letter to actually have that much weight. I'm planning on reading them all just to make sure they fall in my wish list somewhere, that they're a mystery, um, things like that. But I see the uh, query and even the synopsis as being a part of the process that I would hope we would better later on. And so for me, it really comes down to the pages and the voice that comes out on the pages. So not a ton of weight. I kind of agree with Kate. Um, having never done this before, I kind of imagine that um, a really great, great query letter might make me really excited to read pages, but there's, you know, I'm more excited to be reading your pages versus your query letter. I think writing query letters are a skill that we will be working on that I think it's a lot of people, it's really hard to get good at. So that's one of the things that came out for me for Pitch Wars and hopefully what I will be imparting to the mentee. Yeah, I completely agree. This will be my fourth year of mentoring in Pitch Wars and I was a mentee before that. And I think query letters are great, but like Hallie said, they are very much a skill. And if you don't know it yet, that's not a problem. We're gonna be looking for you know, the tone in the actual pages and the characters that we fall in love with. We can help you with the query letter, so don't stress about it. Read up, make sure you know what you're doing with the query letter before you come into it. Um, but it does not have to be perfect. That's not what we're expecting at this point. Yeah, I feel like our mentors, either are or get quickly very good at like deciphering query letters. And so as long as they can get a sense of the concept from the query letter, that's that's what they're looking for out of them. Um, okay, Kristen asked for the first chapter, is it okay if it's a little bit longer than 10 pages? Our rules do say ten, um, that send the first chapter no matter how long it is. So that's an easy question to answer. Um, and we the 10 pages is only if your first chapter is very short then you can send 10 pages. So it's basically 10 pages or first chapter, whichever is longer. Uh, Laura asks, how prevalent are slush readers for the mentors? And Gwen mentioned this um, at the end of the previous chat. So that's probably where that question came from. Um, so the, Susan, have you ever used a slush reader? I haven't. I really enjoy yeah. reading the slush. Um, I know there are others who do it. And you could get a lot. I think last year I got over 220 submissions and I read all of them because I really, you know, if I'm going to be working with somebody, I want to read everything from the start. Uh, but I know sometimes it is easier to have somebody kind of help you out and say, oh, you're going to love this one. Go check it out. I just haven't done that. Do either of you, Kate or I'm not, Holly? I'm not planning on using a slush reader. Yeah. Me either. Yeah, yeah some... Um, some people do use them and I do feel like it's kind of like a newer thing just in the last, you know, two years or so. Um, but I never used one and a lot of people never use one, but um, especially people who are expected to get a large number of submissions. Those are usually the people that are going to do it. Um, so uh, I, I remember I, I co-mentored one year only and I, I co-mentored with Lee and she's lovely and I would co-mentor with her again, but she um, she went and she did her own thing the next year and that was fine. But um, 
she got to read some of the submissions before I did. And she like, she was like, oh, I found it. I found the one. And I was like, how dare she? <laughs> and then I read it and I was like, okay, yeah, she's right. This is <laughs> so um, we both fell in love with that one. And she knew that I would like it because she knows my, my uh, taste. But um, hmm. okay, Mary asks, do you feel the same about the synopses as you do about the query letters, i.e. they are works in progress? Oh, the synopsis. <laughs> you know, I heard somebody call it a synopsis at my last year's <laughs> in Cry meeting, and I thought that was a very accurate description. <laughs> um, I feel the same way about it. I want to read it for story beats. And, um, you know, if you can inject some voice in it, that's great. But I don't expect it to be the, you know, best, most flowery, well-composed uh, piece of work ever. <laughs> so don't stress. Try not to stress about the, the synopsis. Yeah, I agree. I think as a mentor, and I've been through it, we didn't used to request them. And I would always ask for them. So they weren't part of the initial submission. And I'm thankful that they are now, because I can read that and quickly see if the story is going in a direction that I think is something I'll like, or if it goes completely in a different direction from the query. And I know up front, oh, hey, it's not what I was thinking it was. So I don't need it to be the best written thing ever. I really just needed to tell me what the story is. So I know going into it, what, you know, beginning, middle and end is going to be. I kind of totally echo that. I don't, I think writing like a really good synopsis is another skill that we can work on, but um, it is more about making sure that your book doesn't jump the shark or go a place I totally didn't expect or don't want to go. You know, that's the only reason that it would really, um, really affect it. It wouldn't be like, this is not the most enjoyable read I've ever, you know, synopses are hard. So we were talking about backstory earlier, and I think this question is a follow-up question to that. But um, if y'all just wanna talk kind of in general about backstory in addition to answering this question, feel free to do that. Um, I was given the note to get put backstory, explain when reader meets unknown. But that kind of um, happens in the first chapter. It cuts the action and dialogue, opinions and thoughts on that. With backstory, I would be careful in the first chapter, you only have 10 pages to kind of bog it down and slow down the pace too much. But there are ways, I think, to hint at backstory to say, hey, this is something intriguing that's going to come up later and not spell it out. Um, I agree with that. I think that um, it's a really hard line to find between like dropping in hints that'll make me eager to keep reading your story. Like they're almost like tiny mysteries, you know, that you hint at this thing that I'll find out about later, but actually slowing down the action and the plot and understanding your character in order to go back to something that happened 10 years before. I don't even know who this character is yet. So that sometimes can be tricky. Yeah, I think it's, it's really hard, especially in the first chapter, because there's so much we don't know because we haven't met them yet. So you need to give enough that we're not lost, but you don't want to give too much that we're pulled out of the story trying to figure out what's happened before. And so that's something that the mentors would definitely work on you with if you get picked, is helping you figure out how much is too much backstory. And if you can have one sentence that gets your backstory in for something important, do your quick one sentence and move on. Don't add in you know, a whole paragraph of backstory if you don't need it. Be short and simple, get to the point, and then move on quickly so you stay in the action. Great, uh, any, everyone answered? Okay, cool. Dawn asked, how likely are you to choose a work that falls into your also interested genre, but not your number one genre of interest? I would say that um, Lane and I only put genres of interest on our um, wish list that we were definitely interested in working with. So even if you submitted something that's kind of like speculative fiction and I'm more of a crime writer, if I fall in love with it and know how to help it, I will absolutely pick it. I don't I don't think that I'll be putting greater weight necessarily on um, my genre. Um, that said, if it falls outside of those genres, probably not gonna pick it. 
I've, I've had a couple of questions of follow up. Hey, do you accept paranormal, paranormal or speculative? And the answer is yes. For me, it just matters if they're in the mysteries. If your manuscript would be in the mystery section at a bookstore, then send it to me. Um, that being said, I didn't want to limit myself too much in the wish list because what I'm really looking for is voice. If there's something that I didn't call out specifically in my wish list, but I get it and I just love the voice, then absolutely I'll pick it. So I don't think I wait anything that was called out specifically more than others. I did also list a couple weaknesses I have for stories, like stories that have a pet sidekick or stories that have this specific little thing I might get really excited about. But if your story doesn't have that, that's okay. Yeah, I think for me, as long as it's a category that's on my wish list and it doesn't fall into the ones I was really specific and said, I don't want these things, um, I'll be more than happy for something to you know show up if it's, hey, here are the random things I like. If your story fits one of these, sure, send it to me. You know, I'm like Kate, I'm looking for a voice. I'm looking for a story that from the first page, I want to keep reading. And that's how it's been with all of three of my former mentees is as soon as I read it, I was like, oh, I don't want to stop reading. And I got to the end of the first chapter and was like, oh, now I have to wait for them to send me more. This is sad, I want to read this book right now. That's really what I think most all of us are looking for, that even if it's kind of a side you know, piece of information that we put in our wish list, as long as it fits, I think we'll all be happy with it. Sorry, my mouse jumped. <laughs> then I accidentally removed Susan for a second. All right, <laughs> that's the problem with touch pads. Okay, Maxwell asked, uh, oh goodness, that wasn't me that time. Uh, how many requests for full manuscripts do you expect to make if you receive 200 submissions like Susan said she received last year? And I do want to start off with a caveat that like it wildly depends and everyone I've heard say like, I'm only going to request X number. Um, ends up requesting more. So. Yeah, I'll I'll start just since I've requested them before, if that's okay. Um, I think I typically request maybe between 10 and 15. That doesn't mean it won't be different this year. Um, really, it's the ones I fall in love with and the ones I run and read more of. Um, and talking, you know, I'll start emailing with the potential mentees ahead of time when I'm, you know, send questions and ask them to try and get a feel for, you know, if it's something I could work with them on. Um, but who knows how many it'll be this year, depending on how many I fall in love with. I'm not going to set a limit. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm going to request 10 and stop there. Because if I fall in love with 20, I'm going to request 20 <laughs> or more, depending on, you know, just what I see in my inbox. I kind of uh, second that. I've never done this before, but um, Lane and I aren't setting any sort of limit or goal. It's really just going to be about um, we'll request as many as make us want to read more. Same as Hallie and Susan. I just I hope I request a bunch. I hope I get a bunch of submissions that are just awesome and I want to read more of. <laughs> totally. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you all requesting fulls or partials and batches or at once? <sighs> Since this is my first time, I'm not sure, but I like, um, I think I'll probably request as I go so I don't accidentally forget one along the way. Or, or um, and usually I want to be like, as soon as I'm excited about something, I want to request it. Mm -hmm. And I also love, um, I think I'm big on communication. And as soon as I know I want to read something else, I'd like that person to know too. But that being said, I'm not sure what order I'll be reading things in. So if you don't see yours requested right away, don't panic. So I don't know. I'm going to request as I go. That's my plan. Um, I think Lane and I will be requesting partials and um, we will probably be doing it in batches because I think we'll be communicating with each other a lot so that otherwise I would probably be requesting as I go too. So I don't, I, that's my answer. Yeah, I usually do it as I go. Um, I try and read them in order. Doesn't always happen. But usually I mark the ones I really want. And then at some point later in the day, I'll go through and if there are a couple, I'll request them. But usually it's, you know, the day that they come in, if I can get to it that quickly. And depending on how I feel about it, once I read the synopsis, 
you know, that's how I'll decide if I want the full or a partial. But usually for me, it's been easier just to ask for the fulls up front so that I don't have to keep going back and saying, hey, can I have more? <laughs> At least then I have it. And if I want to keep reading, I can keep reading until the end. I was thinking of doing that too, Susan, just request the full up front yeah. and go from there. Yes, it makes it easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the beauty of Gmail is you have enough storage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yep. have them in there. Um, I also, when, when I was mentoring, I often would request submissions like in the last week <laughs> because it would be like a, a pitch that I just keep like thinking about. And, and so mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, let me see, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> let me make sure I'm not missing that. Um, Sarah asked, uh, what are things you hate to see in submissions? Mm -hmm. Hate is a strong word, but what do you dislike in submissions? <laughs> Hate is a strong word for that. I'm not sure that there's anything I would hate. Um, mostly, I think as long as you're following like general query guidelines and you're being polite, I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody in Pitch Wars who wasn't professional. Um, but I really think that's what we're looking for. Otherwise, you know, story-wise, I don't think there's anything that you know I didn't put in my wish list. To say, hey, I don't want this. That you know, if it popped up in a manuscript, that would turn me off. Yeah, I agree. Just professional, polite, courteous, and yeah, pretty basic. I will say if there's a lot of typos in the query or synopsis, I mean, I, we say like, we'll work with you on that, but I don't want to see something riddled with typos, especially if it's just a paragraph or two long. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of echo um, what both of you said, kind of professional, polite. Um, I know for Lane and I particularly, we're looking for something that has a pretty um, solid plot and we can work with you on developing your plot or changing it. You know, um, we did a lot of that with my book last year, but uh, it need, it does need to have kind of a, a rising action plot. Okay. Um, Joanna asks, how important is formatting slash grammar in the manuscript? Oh, formatting. <laughs> you know, I want things to be clean and easy to read. Uh, grammar, it's nice if it's been edited. You know, I don't want to read a bunch of typos. Um, that being said, I mean, I've gone through, I don't know, do a dozen revisions on my novel that'll be out in June, and I keep finding typos that everybody seems to miss. Like, it just happens. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important that you're you've gone through it at least once or twice. Like we don't want first drafts. Mm -hmm. that, I think that's the big thing is we wanna make sure that you've done the work already. You've done it, gotten it as clean as you can, but like Kate said, we're always gonna miss stuff. Like that's why there are so many rounds of editing once you get a book deal is you need to have all these other eyes on it because as the writer, you're probably gonna miss it. So some typos are okay, mm -hmm. but we really don't want you know multiple typos on every page because that just makes it so difficult to read. And personally, I would probably just give up even if I love the story, because I know it's gonna take so much work just to get it cleaned up for me to be able to get into it and really dig into it the way I would need to developmentally. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. You know, typos happen to everybody. Um, it just, you wanna make your story as easy to read and as easy for somebody to say yes to and like love like a, a lot of what the work of Pitch Wars, I think usually tends to be more about character or plot or different things. You want people to be able to see the bigger picture um, structural issues and not get held up of being like, I can't even get through this. So typos are fine, but you know, not too many. You want to make it readable. All right, um, Ebony <laughs> said that. She loves my new backdrop. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was like, uh, the other ones would look better, but I like this one more. Um, I was just looking up that for the next question. It is, I think, pretty clearly spelled out on the FAQ, but I want to make sure I answer the right thing. So Ebony asked, should a short prologue, one to three pages, be sent as part of the first chapter? So what it says on the website is, um, you can send prologues that are prologues that are no more than five pages along with your first chapter. If your if your prologue is longer, then just send your first chapter. So 
So that's on the FAQ on the website, which you can find, by the way, at pitchwars.org. And so next question. <laughs> Do pitch wars happen a lot or are they rare? <laughs> pitch wars is an annual event. Um, and so again, if you are, if you're stumbling on this and you're not quite sure what pitch wars is, make sure you go to pitchwars.org and read all that information there. Um, Don asks, after you've received any requested partials fulls, do you have a communication with potential mentees to ensure there is a good personality fit prior to making your choice? I absolutely do. Um, and I also, if there are big changes that I wanna suggest making, I've kind of run them by high level through an email and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Is that something you'd be willing to do? And one year I had somebody say, nope, I don't think that aligns with my vision of the book. And I said, okay, great, thanks. And she was still on my list, but then I found something else I fell in love with too. And that author really liked my vision for what we might do for it. Um, so I think, you want to make sure that you're going to have a good working relationship because pitch wars is really hard. It's a couple intense months of kind of tearing your book apart in a lot of cases and rebuilding it. And you want to make sure that you're both on the same page. And as a mentor, we're not going to push our vision on you. We want to make sure it's, you know, it's your book. You're the one who needs to love it. We just want to kind of guide you in what we think might be the best way to do that. Uh, I agree. I think that um, Lane and I will definitely have a little bit of an email back and forth kind of asking you um, not even necessarily what your vision for the book is, but like what do you think the book needs to work on, kind of getting a sense of where you are and what you want to do and how that aligns with how we see it. Um, so yeah, kind of what Susan said, wanting to make sure you're on the same page with edits because it is your book and you want it to be the book that you want it to be. We just want to help you get there. But if you have two totally different visions for how to do that, it may not be a perfect fit. Yep, I'm just gonna echo Susan and Hallie for sure. I think there will be some email communication. I'll add that I'm also planning on probably Twitter stalking you <laughs> with potential ones because I do think it's important to make sure that um, it's somebody you feel like you can work with. So um, yeah, make sure our personalities mesh and um, you're a professional in a lot of different capacities. Okay, um, so we have a clarification about the uh, if wars happen a lot. So they were talking about if the mentors, more than one mentor likes the manuscript. How rare are those? And I can't remember how many we had last year. It was just a handful. Um, we ha I think we had none in adult because yeah. I think Kel Kelly makes everyone like work it out. <laughs> so we, ha we have a spreadsheet that we are all kind of obsessed with that we update as for going. <laughs> Just so we can talk about it. Like if I fall in love with something, I want to know up front that somebody else is falling in love with it too. And we all kind of talk with each other and try and work it out ahead of time so that we don't have to go to war. I think we try and make wars very rare, at least in the adult world. That's what I've been hearing too from yeah. Kelly. And <laughs> uh, because I know like Kelly and Mia, their wish list is very aligned with mine, as <laughs> is Liz Little. Like I just, I, um, I think we're all slightly nervous. We might fall in love with the same one, but we've already kind of said, hey, we'll talk it out and you know, or negotiate behind the scenes. It doesn't have to be an all out battle. And I've heard about the spreadsheet. I'm very excited. To it. <laughs> I do want to talk about the spreadsheet because it's kind of like a sore spot for me because when mentors mention the spreadsheet, the um, hopefuls get like super obsessed about it and get really like nervous about it literally all that's in there is the title of the book. There's not right. like, it's not like we're gossiping about people or like, you know, talking about, you know, all, all kinds of different things. It's literally just the title of the book. So please, right. please, please don't obsess over the spreadsheet. Cause I don't have to answer those questions this year, but <laughs> Lee does. <laughs> yeah. It, it is really just for us to mark which ones that are kind of high on our list so that everyone else has visibility to what we're into. We don't discuss them until we know we might have to go to war. Yeah. Um, okay. Ebony asks, Ebonics plays a huge part in the vernacular of some of my characters. Is that a turn off for anyone? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Easy. Um, what, oh, Laura asks a good question. What are your favorite things to work on in revisions? 
Witty dialogue, personally. <laughs> it's hard to be witty in first drafts. I feel like there's a lot more swearing in my first drafts than in subsequent ones, things like that. But I think for me, it's probably adding in that witty back and forth between characters, fleshing characters out more, um, creating a specific unique voice for each character, which does come through in dialogue, I feel like for me in subsequent drafts. So that's probably my personal favorite. Um, I would say, you know, when you kind of fine tune the plot to get something that you see as having potential or you know it's the right thing, but it maybe kind of doesn't land the way you want it to. And mm -hmm. you can kind of work back and build that and get to that place where all of a sudden it's just like, yes, this is, I knew that this was right and this is how it's right. That's kind of like a, um, a vague thing to say, but I guess maybe plot building, kind of like really fine tuning the plot to get things to land the way that they, you want them to, that they have the effect on the reader that you've kind of seen all along could be there and getting it there. That's one of my favorites. Very yeah. satisfying. <laughs> I think for me, I really enjoy kind of diving deep into the characters and making sure that their emotions are really solid throughout the whole arc and kind of taking them from beginning to end and really clearly showing how that the, how they're changing throughout the story. So I do a lot of character work um, on my own stuff and during Pitch Wars as well. Mm -hmm. I think you might no, be then you're muted. This just made me laugh, so I want to put it up. Ebony said, every day is a pitch war. If you <laughs> haven't yet seen Kyle and Brenda's like videos, um, Kyle has like an alter ego who's preparing for the pitch war. And it's just like super funny. Um, so we um, have run out of questions, but I have questions for y'all. And we can also go back and answer some of the questions from the beginning. Um, we just had a question come in, but um, I'm going to ask my question. It was the first question I asked of the first round of mentors. And so if you want to see those answers and you missed the very beginning of the chat, make sure you rewind and go back and watch those. But the question was, what are some of your tips for a truly outstanding query? You know, there's a... It's a skill, there's a formula, I think, to writing queries, especially for the mystery genre. Uh, my tip would be probably be really careful with your word choice. The best way to um, get some voice in there is being really careful with what verbs are you using? Does this verb, can it be, can it be made more useful, leveraged in a different way to show your voice? So I think word choice is my biggest tip. Just look at every word you're doing and make sure, is this doing as much as it can? Because again, it's a short time, short space. You don't have pages and pages to um, to convince somebody to read your work. So that would be my tip. That was an. Oh, oh, go yeah. ahead, Hallie. <laughs> no, no, you, Susan. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I think one of the things like when I go in the forum and I start reading queries and comment commenting, like I think "punchy" is one of the words I use a lot, or "punch it up," meaning you want to have like Kate was saying, really strong language that is kind of on a different level than what you would normally just read. You want it to be exciting. You want it to be enticing. Everything you're putting in here needs to be really interesting and kind of forcing the reader to say, oh my God, I need to read more of this right now. And so I think the best way I've been able to describe it is just punch it up a little, amp it up, give it a little more oomph in your word choice and like your sentence structure. I'm a big fan of you know, using some short sentences or setting an entire sentence off on its own, which I know you're not always supposed to do in queries, but I think if it's really important, you're gonna catch somebody's attention with this really well-written, spectacular sentence kind of standing on its own. Yeah, uh, I honestly kind of echo Kate and Susan, you have a really short uh, chance to make a great impression. And so you want it to be as sharp and like voicey as possible, mm -hmm. um, just as really kind of trying to intrigue somebody to get it to read more. All right, uh, so Laurel asked, several mentors have mentioned stalking you on know, someone in social media. Is it important that we have active public social media accounts? No. No. <laughs> just if you do, I might read a few of your tweets and just, you know, just to check. But no, I am not, I don't care if you have a social media presence or not. Yeah, I agree. 
Same. But if you do, you know, if we interact ahead of time, like I, the mentee I picked last year, we just chatted, you know, randomly. She would ask me, you know, personal questions because we had stuff in common. And so I was watching her Twitter account a lot just because we were talking more ahead of things. Uh, but if you don't have any social media presence, I think that's fine. Same. Hmm. Nothing to add there. You don't need one. If you do have one, we'll probably look at it, but it's not a make or break by any means. Yeah, two of my um, previous mentees, ha they had a Twitter account, like theoretically, but never tweeted on it. So, <laughs> um, In general, how would you age new adult up in tone and voice to adult? For example, if character is 19 or 21, do you push that age up to 25 to sit squarely in adult? That's a good question. I think it depends on the story. I mean, we can't just automatically say that we'll bump them up to a different age without knowing the character and what they're going through. Like it really is gonna depend on their character arc and what your plot is. And we could definitely work with the mentee if we decided to pick that and decide what's going to be the best age for this um, and kind of make it feel more organic to the story instead of just picking a number and saying, oh, 25 is a good age for adult. We'll start there. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Right. I'm currently rereading Megan Abbott's Dare Me, which all of the main characters are 16 year old girls. And that is very firmly an adult novel. So I, um, I'm i not as well versed in the new adult novels, but I, I mean, I don't think age necessarily has to be the defining factor for aging up a book if you were going to do that. I don't think it's about the main character's age. I think it's about kind of the, uh, the heart of the book and the content of the book. Yep, I agree. I think it depends on the story. It depends on the main plot. Depends on the characters. Um, I, I'm I'm open to new adult, and you know, again, I think we keep coming back to, uh, or at least I do. The voice, if the voice is there and the story is there, um, we could definitely talk about ways to age it up to adult, but that may not be necessary. It just depends. Okay, Kira asked a question that I can answer. Is it possible for a mentee to end up with a mentor they did not submit to? Um, yes, and you have to uh, indicate in your submission package if you would be willing to have other mentors consider you. However, I did want to caveat because every time we talk about this, people, again, kind of tend to obsess over it. Um, it is very rare, and they the mentors actually have to ask for permission before looking at anybody else and I am the mean one, so I'm gonna be saying no more this year than in previous years. So, um, and the reason why that is because it creates a lot of work for our committee, and some mentors will just be asking, you know, because they're curious, and so we're, we're cutting down on that quite a bit. Um, so it, it does happen, but it is very rare, and don't count on it as part of your like strategy or whatever. Um, so Sarah asked for normal querying, some agents want a small bio, should we include bio? And maybe if y'all could talk a little bit about what they would include in that if they were to include one. Um, so if you were to include a bio, it doesn't have to be, um, from my perspective, it doesn't have to be very extensive, but things that I would be interested in knowing are if you have any kind of relevant personal experience to this book that matters in a deep way, if you've, been published anywhere that you want to share um, and maybe if you were going to include it like something some reason maybe that like you might connect to Lane or I you don't have to put that in there but you could say you know like if you had some sort of experience that you thought would mesh like Lane lives in Chicago if you live in Chicago yeah I agree with that I think we do want to see the bio um, I think as part of the submission for Pitch Wars, we're looking for it to be almost exactly what you would send to an agent. Um, and I believe, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how it's been in the past, is that the mentee, potential mentees will send in one query that will go to all of the mentors. So if you personalize it, you'll probably have to put in different like paragraphs, which is oh, fine, um, I've seen that before. So the rules specifically say do not personalize the right. queries. Yeah. Sorry, I gave bad <laughs> advice then, Never mind. <laughs> Um, I think a bio similar to what you would send an agent and um, yeah, like Hallie 
and Susan have said, um, you know, previous publishing experience, if you have had any short stories, especially I think are always interesting. Like if you've been in an anthology, uh, if you've won a contest, if you've been a finalist in a contest and you know, you don't necessarily have to have a ton of publishing experience. It's just a little bio, just a little bit about you. Yeah, and I will add that if you don't have any experience, that is totally okay. <laughs> like I know a lot of people stress about that piece of it. If you don't have anything to say, that's okay. You know, you can just have one line about, you know, if you took any writing classes in college or in high school or wherever, uh, put that. And if not, you can leave your bio out. I don't think anyone will be worried that it's not there. We'll just assume, okay, they didn't have anything that they needed to make sure we were aware of. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is organizations you might belong to is always good, mm -hmm. like Sisters in Crime. Like I would find it interesting if you were in Sisters in Crime, like, hey, there's sister, you know, <laughs> um, but things like that. And that's specific to mysteries, um, that organization. Yeah, I was saying if it doesn't um, indicate your dedication to writing and publishing a book um, or your expertise in that area, then it's really not necessary in a query bio. Some people like to talk about like their animals and their day job, that's not necessary. <laughs> um, Stacy asked, do you see room in the market for a narrower or less common genre like magical realism? How much do you take into account the market and what is selling when you choose a mentee? Go ahead, Hallie. No, you go ahead. <laughs> no, you let me go earlier. <laughs> okay, um, I would say, I. I don't think that I would ever or Lane would ever knock out a submission because we are like, I just don't see this selling. You know, if you have a great book with like a, a really interesting voice, really strong characters, I always think that you can find a market for it. It doesn't have to be like, this is the hot trend in publishing right now. Do you want to go, Susan, or do you want me to go? You can. Um. I think this is a really interesting question. Uh, I'm not going to not pick something because I don't think it'll sell. There might be some discussion behind the scenes, like how are we gonna pitch this? Or would you be okay if we pitched it as this to make it fit more into the, um, like what's expected for the mystery genre and make sure you're okay with it. Like there would be some back and forth and it would be more, I feel like that's almost, if you've got the book, like Hallie said, if you've got a really good book, great voice, then that's awesome. And then it's almost a positioning thing when you go to query and do the agent showcase. And so I think there, that's where that will get interesting. But there would be some discussion to make sure you'd be okay with anything we decided to do or what where my mind was going with how to, how to make it not more sellable, but just how to really sell it. Yeah, I agree with both of you. And I think for me, like I love magical realism. I am all for it in my submissions. Like it's one of the first things on my wish list. So, you know, for me, I would love to see it, but I also think, I feel like as a mentor, my job is to help you learn, not just craft, but also the industry. And so we would definitely talk about whether, you know, there's a market for certain things. And if I don't know, I can reach out to friends and ask them, you know, if they're in, you know, a different genre than I am. And it's not going to stop me from picking something. If I love it, I love it. And I want to help the mentee and I want to do what I can to help their career. Even if this book doesn't end up going anywhere at the end of the day, pitch wars is for me all about learning something. And like, that's what I want my mentee to get out of it is being able to come away with a manuscript that's better and things that they can take to their next book, which might end up being more marketable. Someone had asked how my cat is doing. She's made an appearance on several videos. She is, it's the middle of the day here. So she is of course napping in the sun coming in from the window. So <laughs> no, she's all the way across the room over there. Uh, she's happy. <laughs> okay, so follow up to the new adult question. If someone submitted a book that you think would be best aged down to YA, would that be a hard pass or would you still be willing to work with them? Are y'all wondering if that's even allowed? Well, I know <laughs> it was done last year. Um, yeah, it, it was done um, I, once or twice. Yeah, like I think ever. it's, but personally, I would be more than happy to stick with it and help 
a mentee age it down to YA because I also write YA. Uh, So I think that was probably more a deciding factor for mentors is if you're comfortable with that, I think they'd probably say yes. So I absolutely would. Yeah, that's a hard uh, answering for myself. It's probably a no. No. I don't know if you is kind of the opposite of what Susan just said. I don't write YA and I know that there are very specific um, structures and beats to hit there. So I don't think I would be the best person to help move a book to YA because I, it's not, um, it's not what I know very well. Wait, I fall somewhere in the middle. I, I love reading YA and I could see it being like, maybe if I, if the manuscript was, if I was just blown away by the voice, then I think that would, be really fun. I actually, I, I have a soft spot for YA mysteries. Um, that being said, I feel like I understand the adult marketplace a little bit better. So um, that's why it's, it's a maybe. I don't know if I would be the best to help help you position it. Um, to Yeah, for, I don't know. <laughs> maybe. I will add that if you're submitting new adult, you can submit to anyone who's accepting new adult. So you can submit to young adult mentors who are accepting new adult. Um, you can even split it up and do like two adult people and two YA people. Um, so that may be an option for you. But always, I always recommend that you try to figure out what your book is before submitting, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> um, Laura says, how do you put in your submission package that you're interested in working with a mentor you didn't submit to? It's literally just a checkbox. Like it's a required question that you have to answer yes or no to. So it's easy. Um, our, Jennifer asks, are older main characters marketable? For example, mine is 35. In most fantasy series I've seen, they were a bit younger. Um, this is, for mysteries, I think 35 is actually on the younger side, I would say. <laughs> so um, I think that's great. I mean, there's, in the cozy genre market, there's, like, much older um main characters. I don't see that being a turn off at all. Same. Not for uh, not for the genres that I mm-hmm. tend to work in or read. I don't think 35 doesn't seem old. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll just put that out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think for the one, the categories and uh, the genres I'm taking, 35 is probably fine. I don't know enough about fantasy to answer that since you specifically mentioned that, you know, some fantasy characters are a lot younger than that. So I am not sure, but I, I would guess you could ask on Twitter to the mm-hmm. fantasy mentors and one of them could definitely tell you a little bit better. Yeah, I uh, kind of wish this had been asked in the last hour because uh, Maxim was here. She could have uh, expanded on the fantasy thing a little bit more. All right. So Don asked, that's why I was confused. FAQ had said not to personalize, but personalize was mentioned a few times. So that just, um, we try to get the mentors to read everything that we tell them to read, but sometimes they miss things. So um, if you have questions about rules, you should always check with the Pitch Wars Twitter account or the Pitch Wars Gmail rather than a mentor, because sometimes a mentor may not be aware of like some of the smaller like nitpicky rules that we have. Um, so I always recommend if you have like a procedural question like that to just reach out directly to the, um, the official like Pitch Wars channels. Um, let's see. So Sandra asked a question and, um, it's about mentors, like basically being open to dark and gritty, but not violence. If domestic violence is part of the story, that is a question that is much better just asked to individual mentors because there's no like a blank answer that we can give you for that. So I would recommend you reach out to the mentors that you're looking at submitting to and whatever, uh, method they've asked, just go ahead and ask them either on their blog posts or, or on Twitter or whatever they prefer. Um, Laura asks, uh, follow up to other question, what is the thing you struggle with the most in revisions? How would you help a potential mentee if they had that issue? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's tough. tough. (laughs) It's always something I don't expect, right? And it changes from manuscript to manuscript. Um, for speaking very specific to the mystery genre, uh, to my last um, 
revisions I did, it was um, making sure that suspects were eliminated from the list at just the right time and following through with that plot and the mystery, the mystery plot, uh, making sure, yeah, that suspects, yeah, were eliminated as we go and um, at just the right time, but not too early and not too late. And that's a really, that's very specific. And I feel like I learned a lot in my last revision doing that. Um, and so I guess if this, were to come up, it would actually be something I think it might be a strength now because I'm going to be super nitpicky about that <laughs> going forward. It's like anything that you're called out on and then you're forced to like really work on that, then it becomes something you pay a lot of attention to in somebody else's work. So um, yeah, I think just for me, the very specific um, mystery plot and when suspects come in and when the final clue, you know, clues are unveiled along the way and, and things like that. I would say for me, what's really hard is that when I run into a problem in my own work, it's it's usually when you run into the problem, the problem is already behind you, right? Like it's like you get to an issue when you're writing, but the problem is that you have to figure out what, what you have to break four chapters earlier to fix it. That's the hardest part for me is I, I can see where the problems are and then going back and fixing it. And you know, I think part of what makes Pitch Wars so great is um, for me, what's always been really helpful is just being able to talk it out with somebody. So having your mentor there that you can really just kind of bounce ideas off of and like look through all the possible issues with any new solutions you come up with. It really is just kind of about like having that sort of writing community and having somebody who's always there to kind of like, and as involved and like in love with your book as they can be to try to help you work through those problems. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Allie, is having kind of that brainstorming. You're not expected to figure it out on your own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the mentors yep. are gonna be there to kind of see it from the kind of larger perspective. Like as the writer, you were so in it, you know all the details, you know what is in the story, even if it's not actually on the page. And so the mentor can come in and very clearly say, hey, I think you're trying to do this, but I need these pieces of information actually put on the page. Mm -hmm. And I know for me in revisions, a lot of that comes down to like character emotion that I'm not having them react the right way or I'm not showing that internal emotion as well. And so that's one thing that I've been working on a lot in the last couple of revisions. And I know it's something I worked on with my mentee last year is really trying to make sure that you're pulling the emotional journey together as well as like the actual plot journey for the character. Mm -hmm. And so that that's one thing that I struggle with and really make sure I do in revisions and is easier for me to kind of, like Kate said, once you're in it for so long, then it kind of stands out at you immediately, especially when you're reading for somebody else. You're like, oh, I do that all the time. I know how to help them with this. Yep. And it's always easier for somebody else to read your manuscript and pick those things out than it is yourself. Um, Absolutely. And having somebody to bounce ideas off of, like you both have said, so, so helpful. Yeah. Okay, um, are foreign words or themes a no-no or a pass? I think that would be fine. Yeah. I mean, as long as the story calls for it, absolutely, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, Ebony asks, are there any resources out there to help in considering what specific genre your book falls into? or maybe it's just some general advice about how uh, to figure out your genre. And I'm gonna just say like, reading is honestly, I think the best way to figure this out. Yeah. But if y'all yeah. have any more info. Go to a bookstore as we all do, <laughs> probably um, a lot. And actually just peruse some of the shelves and see where you think your book would fit in there, where you think your manuscript would fit. Agreed. Yep. What are the writers of the books that you think your book is most like? Yes. You know, how are mm -hmm. they categorized? Yeah, if I was going to say, look at your comp titles that you're putting in your query letter, where do those books fall? That's mm -hmm. most likely where yours would fall if you're considering it to be a similar style or, you know, similar writing, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you have a manuscript where you have highlighted problem areas and mentors request a full, do you reply and let them know you have that or just send them a clean manuscript? Um, I always caution against like 
you know, telling the mentor ahead of time what your problems are. <laughs> Because if they disagree with you, that's an automatic no for them. Um, <laughs> or it also like, you're just like, oh, here's all the things wrong with my manuscript. I hope you like it. <laughs> I feel like that can, is kind of weird. Um, yeah. Don't sell yourself short. Don't tell us what you think is wrong with it. Try and sell yourself. And, um, you know, also, I think it's always easier to see the negatives and the positives. And maybe some of the things you say, like, oh, this is a big problem. We would we wouldn't actually even notice. We would. <laughs> I, I don't know. It might be that. that yeah. And you don't want to turn us off to um, or actually have it be a no. And otherwise it would have been a yes, like Sarah said. Yeah. And if if you get picked, that's and your mentor doesn't bring up those issues, you could always mention them and say, like, did you think that this was a problem? But I, I agree. I would just send a clean manuscript. Yep, absolutely send a clean manuscript. And I know at least some of the mentors, and I think Callie mentioned it earlier as well, is in that communication we're doing, if we've requested something from you, we're probably going to ask some questions. And one of them will be, you know, what do you, what's your biggest problem with this? What are you having the most trouble with? And that's when you can bring it up, but don't tell us up front. All right, what are your opinions on large casts? How would you slim large casts or tell a mentee to? I like, I mean, it depends on what you mean by large cast. I would just be hesitant to include too many characters in the opening chapter. And, um, you know, I think a large cast in mysteries is actually really fun. There's more suspects. And, you know, I think if there gets to be too many people, though, you look at something like combining characters later on to make one character even more, have more oomph for more punch, <laughs> as Susan said earlier, you know. Um, but I, it just, it kind of depends. I feel like the answer to this is like, it depends. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, and I think as long as it's limited to a few POVs, if the large cast is just people who appear in the story, that's one thing as opposed to a large number of point of view characters that I think is where things get a little muddled. But if you have a lot of characters, you know, they're popping in here and there, like Kate said, I think that's something where you might want to look at it and combine them when you need to. Um, but otherwise, as long as they have distinct personalities and they're adding something to the story, having a lot of characters is fine. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with both Kate and Susan and Sarah too, with the like, it depends. It's really, it's yeah. hard to make a hard and fast rule about that. All right. Uh, for previous mentors, are you still in touch with previous mentors? Susan? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I, I actually talked to all three of them. Um, one of them, we talk frequently just because we have a ton in common and we've become really good friends. So we're messaging each other a lot. And the other two, we talk not quite as often, but still, you know, some personal live stuff and also book related stuff when they're on submission or when they're doing a new revision, you know, I've, I've told them I'm happy to be around and bounce ideas off of just to, you know, have another opinion. So for me, it's as much about forming a relationship with the mentee throughout Pitch Wars, you know, that's going to continue on. It's after the agent round, I'm not done. Like, I'm in this, we're friends, I want to help you. And I'm probably going to ask you to help me too. I've had former mentees read my manuscripts and give me feedback. Um, just because I was their mentor at one point doesn't mean that I'm always their mentor. It means that, okay, I've done what I can for you. Let's keep going and kind of bring you in and have you help me as well. And uh, I was a mentee last year, so I can speak from the mentee side. I mean, Lane and I still talk very frequently. We're good friends. Um, I actually became friends with another mentor, not my mentor, Wendy Hurd, uh, who lives in LA from last year. And we see each other all the time. I mean, I think the best thing that comes out of Pitch Wars is the community. So you hope to build those um, relationships that are longer than just, uh, just the Pitch Wars. All right, um, so that is all the questions that we have. So I'm just going to ask each of the mentors in their outro to let us know where, you can, where we can find you online. If you have any announcements you want to make, like books coming out or things, you know, um, 
happening that you want to share giveaways or whatever and then also if you could list um your favorite like writing or publishing resource whether it's a book or a website or a podcast or something like that mm. i'll start with kate <laughs> yeah uh, my uh i guess an announcement would be my first book my debut will be out june 2020 with berkeley it's called killer chardonnay and uh it's about a winemaker in Boulder who also, uh, who expertly pairs solving crime with uh, <laughs> owning a winery. So um, no books out right now. Uh, my favorite writing resource has to be uh, writing the breakout novel by Donald Moss. I feel like that changed the way I both um, wrote and made me a stronger writer, helped me find my voice. And it also made me a more analytical reader. So that's just a fantastic resource for writers. And it's been really fun chatting with you guys. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Susan? Um, so you guys can find me online. Uh, most social media, I'm just at SB Crispell. And so I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. And on Facebook, I think it's a full author, Susan Bishop Crispell. Um, but I'm usually on there. I'm not overly chatty. Um, I share a lot of stuff, but if you want to ask me questions or if you want to talk, please come do. I'm more than happy to meet with everybody and answer what questions that I can. And I think um, for me, I don't have any exciting news book related, but I am moving to Scotland tomorrow. So I'll be kind of out of commission for a couple of days. So if you ask questions and I don't respond, it just means I'm traveling and I promise I'll get to you as soon as I can. <laughs> and then writing resources. One, I think for Query, if you haven't read the Query Shark blog, I think it's amazing. It uh, mm -hmm. Janet Reed does it, and it it's just it's something every writer needs to read if you're querying. She gives such great examples and kind of goes through and tears them apart and shows you how to put them back together. And there are real life queries that people have submitted to her. It's a fantastic resource. Then I also think the book Story Genius by Lisa Cron. I found really helpful, especially from a character development standpoint, trying to nail down what the character wants and why, and kind of what's causing their story long obstacle for me was kind of life changing. That I figured, oh, if I find this out early before I even start the book, then my character arcs are going in the right direction from the start, and I don't have to go back and redo a bunch later on. Uh, you can find me online um, most easily on Twitter at Hallie underscore Sutton. Uh, happy to answer any questions or chat or anything. Um, hit me up. Uh, my debut novel comes out from Putnam next summer. Uh, it's called The Lady Upstairs, and it's a feminist noir about women running a blackmail agency targeting um, bad dudes like Harvey Weinstein. So uh, it was fun. <laughs> and um, I was going to mention Query Shark too. I think it's like such an invaluable resource. Um, but also I wanted to mention uh, last year for Pitch Wars Lane had me read Save the Cat Writes a Novel by Jessica Brody. And I will never write another novel without it. I recommend. All right. I thank you. Oh. oh, I forgot to say where you could find me. Twitter, oh, okay. Instagram, you know, <laughs> blog. <laughs> Thank you to the right. mentors for joining us. And thank you to everyone who stopped by and um, asked questions as well. And I'm Sarah Nicholas. You can find me on Twitter at Sarah underscore Nicholas, Sarah Nicholas .com. Uh, Sarah has an H, Nicholas has no H. Um, and then also this is my YouTube channel. So if you want to see some more, you know, Pitch Wars advice videos I have coming next week. And I'm also launching a big project in October. I can't quite detail yet, but um, if you would subscribe, I would really appreciate it. And I'm gonna um, switch the screen over to the uh, all the Twitter and video chat schedule. So if you wanna check those out, um, you, can, you can see the dates there while we get everyone signed off of the chat. And thank you everyone for watching. You can find out more about Pitch Wars at pitchwars.org. If you want to catch this chat and all the other chats, you can go to bit.ly slash pitchwarslive. And there is a, um, sorry, there is a video playlist there of all the previous mentor chats. Thank you guys so much for watching and have a great night.